webinar. Um, and we're really happy to welcome Professor Talat Rahman from um, UCF, where she is the Pegasus Professor. And so she has a broad research program in computational modeling of materials uh, on many, many scales, including catalysis. Um, and so I think we'll hear a little bit about that today. Um, and uh, so I just want to mention that for our questions, you can put them into the chat as the presentation progresses and Talat will actually pause in the middle to answer questions about the first part and then talk about the second part just because there's two parts. Um, and if you would like to ask it live, then just put an X in the chat window and Nitish or, or me, um, we will just call on you to, to speak and then you can interact live. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for doing this for us, Talat, and we're really looking forward to it. So I'll just mute myself now. Hello, Chalan. Hi, hi, Jens. So this is a, this is really a pleasure, and uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. So it's laughing. really a pleasure because it takes me back again. So we shouldn't be talking about it, but I think uh, the first time that Jens and I met was in 1982, where before, it, I think we should we should not talk about this. So. Yeah, but, but, but <laughs> it was probably before Karen and. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 uh, but, the, but, but the most memorable, uh, well, there are many memorable uh, occasions, uh, many, many of them, somehow I cannot even talk about, uh, but because, because just that it, it is a lot of uh, really good uh, conversations. But one I remember was when I came and uh, 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 there and um, a good friend from uh, uh, Texas A&M. Uh, was uh, with us and we and uh, and then and, and, uh, uh, Jens and I uh, talked about uh, the system in the US as opposed to the system in in, in Denmark and uh, Wayne Goodman and I were on different sides of, uh, of this and I just wrote an email to Jens not too long ago that what we are going through right now is just actually it's it's not pleasant. So maybe I won't talk about that. And I'll go over to talk about uh, things that are keeping my sanity, <laughs> which is looking at some materials uh, that uh, that and, and again, if you fall, I mean, you know, I I can look at. I mean, again, has of course gone way ahead in many areas. But we all started from the same materials, and we seem to be ending with, the, with similar materials. I think one of the first papers that we were looking at was oxygen on copper, the reconstruction of uh, copper surfaces with oxygen. So you know how <laughs> way back that goes. But OK, so this, this is really such a, such a pleasure for me. So what I'll do today is I'll talk about actually two materials. Uh, one I included here, and I will talk about here. This is molybdenum disulfide. Again, pioneering work in this area was done uh, in, the, in Jens's group and also in, in Denmark because uh, of the big, uh, you know, this is uh, where uh, uh, Topso has this uh, uh, monopoly basically on molybdenum based catalysts and, and we're still trying to understand how it really works. Uh, the other is this hexagonal boron nitride, which we find to be a fascinating material and something that I won't talk about today and I'll just give you a teaser for that, is that this hexagonal boron nitride with nitrogen vacancies is actually what they're talking about as for qubits for quantum uh, uh, emission. And, and, and so one thing that comes to mind is that won't it be interesting to connect the properties that give rise to interesting chemical properties on the one hand and these very amazing quantum properties. But that is not going to be my, uh, my topic. But I did want to tell you about uh, you know, uh, UCF because I, I'm not sure everybody here knows about it. Uh, it is not University of California in Florida. It's actually University of Central Florida. And the, the amazing thing is the, is the number of students that we have. In fact, last year we had less than 70,000 and we were expecting that number to drop because of COVID and everything else. But the number has actually increased and we now have 71,600 students. 
Uh, not all of them uh, hopefully are on campus. Only a third of them are allowed. None of them should be allowed, but that's not my decision. Uh, we have uh, 52 faculty in the department and we have a very vibrant program. So if you're interested in that, please go to our website. Uh, before I say anything, I should thank the people who have uh, done the job here. And, and as you will see, uh, uh, most of the work from my group was done actually most. Dewey is the person who's contributed tremendously to the project. And uh, Tao Jiang uh, has also, as has Takat and Zahra has also done some calculations. On the experimental, experimental side, I'll show you some results, actually some that I got yesterday from Richard Blair's group. Katerina and David are working in, 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 in his group. And Peter Darwin and Ludwig Bartels uh, and, uh, and Richard and I have been working for quite a while together, particularly with Ludwig, I've, I've been working since 2003. So I'll give you some results of that. The other people I, I show you, they are doing various other things in my group. And so we have quite an interesting time, continue to have an interesting time over Zoom. Uh, so basically my talk will be after a brief introduction, which I don't think anybody here would need. Uh, I would uh, talk about uh, why 2D materials at, uh, as catalyst, and then focus firstly on molybdenum disulfide, and then on hexagonal boron nitride. So, and, and please, if you uh, feel uh, that there's anything needs clarification, do ask. So I don't need to tell you anything about this. So I'm going over to the next slide because we know that uh, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide have to be taken care of and be converted into, into usable materials, more um, value added materials. Uh, 2D materials, of course, the main thing is that they have this large surface to bulk ratio, but beyond that, the endless ways to functionize them uh, and the flexibility and the fact that you can act, act strain, the fact that you can have grain boundaries, the fact that you can encapsulate molecules within them, on them, under them, over them, all of that may, makes uh, really good, uh, good uh, motivation uh, to keep trying uh, to make them um, uh, catalytically active. There's also, with all the interest in graphene, for all the reasons that you know, and now molybdenum disulfide and all the others, uh, there is this potential for mass production of 2D materials. So that's why we want to persist on, on making these uh, catalytically active. Of course, as you all know, that maybe they are the reason those 2D materials have been around, and, 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 and one of the things is that they're very stable and inert. One is the lubricants, they are good uh, supporters uh, for reactions and so on. And, uh, and, and so, you know, they of course uh, have a strong intraplanar bonds and then weak van der Waals. So these are all van der Waals materials. But because of that, they, the basal plane typically, whether it is molybdenum disulfide or hexagonal boron nitride, uh, hexagonal boron nitride, which basically is an insulator, it needs to be. Uh, activated, and so does molybdenum disulfide. And, uh, and so what we will show, I'll give you examples of how they can be activated with defects and then with nanoparticles. Uh, this is again something just I'm going to uh, go uh, quickly because this is essentially what Jens has been uh, promoting uh, for a long time that basically theory and simulation and experiment working together. We learn from each other, we go back and forth, and then we try to predict, synthesize, and observe. And as you all know, this became the big mantra in the Obama area, <laughs> era, uh, which we are still nostalgic about uh, with the materials genome initiative. So, so anyway, so that's uh, kind of what goes behind it. I will not spend any time giving you details about the, about the theory because basically uh, density functional theory is our workhorse. We apply hybrid functionals when we need them. We apply DFT plus U when we need them. We include Van der Waals interactions almost always now. We have to for these materials. Uh, we do the uh, climbed image nitro elastic band method from Henkelman and uh, Johnson for uh, calculating all these uh, uh, energy barriers. 
we do kinetic Monte Carlo simulations for reaction rates, reaction rates and turnover frequencies. And then, you know, there are lots of times when we have to look at vibration frequencies for um, experimental verification and also for calculating prefactors. And then we also do look at phonon dispersion and uh, if you are looking at relative stability of different types of uh, 2D materials, uh, because not of all of them are going to be stable and so on. So these are things that, again, if you, anybody's interested, please send me an email. My email is very simple, just tell it my first name at ucf.edu. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, this is an old slide from a paper that we wrote in 2014. And that was basically when Ludwig Bartels was doing experiments, trying to create uh, vacancies. And of course, what we found that yes, indeed, vacancies can not only be created, but in this uh, uh, article by the Finland, Finnish group, uh, they show that vacancies are inherently present. And in fact, that could be one reason why inherently uh, molybdenum disulfide is an endoped material rather than a, 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 a pure semiconductor. So uh, what, we, well, what makes then, when you have vacancies, what makes it reactive is, of course, what you get is that you get these frontier orbitals that come, that are then pushed very close to the, to the Fermi energy, both the uh, unoccupied, unoccupied here and the occupied there. And this playing with the Fermi uh, fr frontier orbitals is one of the uh, features that we are looking at when we want to say whether something is uh, a reactive or an active site or not. And these are then the mid-gap states, which of course emerge when you create vacancies, okay? So this is just, a, the, just the, the simple idea that, you know, when you have uh, a you know, transition metal, of course, you have, a, a, you know, all the way up to the Fermi level is occupied. In molybdenum disulfide, of course, you have a gap. Uh, if you have a vacancy row, then what you start seeing are these uh, occupied and unoccupied orbitals very close to the Fermi level. And of course, if you put uh, either vacancy, I mean, uh, nanoparticles or any gold, copper, silver nanoparticles, or even grow it on a copper on copper or so, then of course, if there's an, even an enhancement of the, of the effect. And these are some things that I'll just briefly mention. Now, again, I am going to go over these uh, a little bit quickly because uh, I would like, uh, I'll leave these slides and papers are there and you can also get uh, help. Uh, I mean, any questions you have, you can ask me anytime. But basically what we are showing here is the, just the potential energy uh, uh, diagram, the, the pathway. And what you find is that if you start with syngas, so that has been our thing. Syn what, what can we do? What can we convert syngas to. The idea was to convert it either to methanol or ethanol and higher alcohols and so on. So, so essentially there are barriers and then of course we have also looked at things like coverage dependence and, and, and co-adsorption and all of that. But I'll give you just a simple picture here that if you do a very simple kind of calculation and when you try to look at what, uh, what are the uh, different uh, barriers. It's so uh, the processes, of course, is that you're going to have, you want to have hydrogen dissociate, then you want the hydrogen to diffuse and, and form CHO, adsorbed uh, there, then you get formic acid, then from formic acid, you get with further dissociation of hydrogen, you essentially will get uh, methyl and then methanol, right? So, so basically, a methoxy. And then, 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 then methanol. So, so this was uh, when we looked at that. This actually, uh, we thought that the barriers were high. This is an electron board. But when we talked to our experimentalists, they said, "Well, most reactions under industrial conditions are at temperatures where this is, won't be unreasonable." So we said, "Okay, fine, that's okay." Uh, but we thought that maybe, maybe uh, we had we had done this calculation for just a row vacancy. And which it doesn't, which confines the diffusion of uh, the entities. And so, what about if we had a cluster of vacancies? And of course, if you have a cluster of vacancies, then of course these barriers are actually very um, low. And uh, and if you look at it, you say, well, maybe 
maybe this is actually going to be pretty good. But on the other hand, it could be that if you have too many vacancies, then some of these intermediates may just be very comfortable sitting on the surface and may not diffuse. Okay, so those are concerns. But then, of course, all of these things, as you know, kinetics plays an important role, temperature plays an important role, and so one needs to know what goes on in experiments. So that's where we started uh, talking to Richard Blair, who is basically he, uh, a chemical engineer, although his degree is in chemistry, and he is one of these people who is uh, very ingenious at that, and, and his whole idea is, tell me what to what you're expecting, and I think I can show that it will happen if, if your foundations are correct. So essentially what he found, and we were very excited about that, is that he gets methanol. And this paper is not published yet because, uh, because we're still mulling over exactly what, what is going on. And I'll tell you why uh, I, I'm hesitating. So they got, they, when they, uh, so what he does, the main thing is that in his reactions, which are more, you know, industrial scale, not quite, but, but actually ready to be uh, scaled up. And so this is not UHV uh, experiments, but basically he does ball milling and, and that creates defect. And what he finds is that if you did unpromoted, no ball milling, that you, there was no, nothing happened. But then when you do this in this batch flow react uh, mode, and, uh, and there was, without the application of force, there wasn't. But as soon as you apply force to it, you get this, and this is, uh, and you get not only um, methanol, but other products as well. And we're still trying to understand essentially how that happens. We've removed all other possibilities that could have led to this Fisher drop kind of uh, process. But uh, I'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Actually, it's right here. So this, data actually, uh, Katerina gave it to me yesterday. And uh, this is quite interesting. This is when she has just MOS2. Then again, you know, I mind you, we've been working on this for several years. And so most uh, of the other uh, contaminations have been removed. And what she's really looking at uh, finds is that if you do not apply any force, essentially this material behaves as a, as a, as, as a, a typical Fisher trough uh, process and you get the, you get all these different uh, unsaturated linear uh, linear saturated hydrocarbons you get propane butane and so on so this is something interesting already and uh, we are in the process of uh, of uh, working uh, through this so now let me take give you uh, two more examples uh, very quickly and then i want to take a to, to, to halt and i have you ask questions and this is what about nanoparticles and then about uh, copper. So nanoparticles, this was something that uh, Ludwig Bartels was very involved in as he had, he creates these single layer MOS2, which are really one of the finest that you can get. And then he deposits uh, um, these uh, gold uh, on that. Uh, of course, theoretically, it's easy to understand that when you have a nanoparticle, uh, you have uh, these all these uh, regions here uh, where there's a redistribution of charge. And of course, depending on the size and the shape of the nanoparticle, you're going to have, uh, you know, these uh, kinks here and, and the regions here where more reaction will take place. But for those who have been working with nanoparticles on, on, uh, on oxides, uh, I wanted to mention a very interesting difference, which I won't go through here, is that when we were looking at gold on titania, the reactions uh, were all taking place, even methanol decomposition, they were all taking place right here at the interface or very close to the interface. When you have gold on, on nanoparticle, reactions are not taking place at the interface, they're actually taking place on the nanoparticle. So this is a very interesting uh, a, a, a comparison. And also the two, uh, gold on titania and gold on MOS2 work as really opposite, in opposite direction. Gold on M titania promotes methanol decomposition. Gold on MOS2 promotes methanol formation, theoretically, and hopefully experimentally, okay? Uh, this is, again, the idea is the same, that once you have gold, you again got these, as you did with vacancies, you got these frontier orbitals very close to the Fermi energy, and they are the ones that are going to take part in the reaction. And so obviously, 
This is the chain that will go on, which I've shown you, starting with the uh, CO and hydrogen and dissociation of hydrogen, then, then formation of CHO and so on and so forth until you finally get methoxy. Once you get methoxy, then you get methanol. Uh, the, the, these are some uh, results which uh, uh, have uh, some validation, which I will show. These are results taken by Tao Jiang and also previously by Takat Rawal, two great students in my group. And essentially what happens is that there's a small barrier, about 0.6 EV for hydrogen dissociation. But once it happens, you pretty much get, I mean, again, we are looking at this as the baseline here with some, some barriers, some barriers that, are, that need to be overcome. But overall, if we just looked at this pathway, now you all have been doing these reactions for a long time and you recognize that, um, that a lot of uh, uh, pathways are available and I haven't taken into account everything here. But essentially, this is showing that uh, we could get to methanol just like we did with, uh, with, with, with the vacancy there. Uh, so what is the experimental validation? Well, there are two. One is, uh, we think in this case a little bit, uh, well, that wasn't our goal because your oxidation has been looked at, but this is where Bartle's group was doing, this is essentially doing titration on this and seeing how when you have the bare MOS2, then you put gold on it, and as you do the CO and then oxygen, and then, and then you basically are looking at the XPS peaks and see how that shifts. And from that analysis, one could conclude that formation of CO2 is happening. Our results for these barriers do show that that is a facile process. So, uh, so this, is, this is all done under very controlled conditions. And that was just a proof of concept. The one that was very interesting was that what uh, uh, Blair was able to do is not, the methanol thing was done, was not quite, one, not, did not quite happen. In other words, when he took gold with, uh, uh, and uh, this, this sample from Ludwig, uh, which was gold nanoparticles on MOS2, and he started with syngas, uh, that was not quite uh, productive in terms of, giving methanol, which is what we were predicting. But what did they did see is if they had methanol and carbon monoxide, then they were going to, then they were able to see acetaldehyde. So that already, this is C2 bond formation, right? You're going from single bond to double bond. And so this is something that we were very excited about. And this is a paper that has been submitted. We were probably trying uh, to hire a journal, but Hopefully, it will be in print very soon. Um, so, so, so essentially, uh, this is, and how does that happen? Well, what happens is that we find that if you just have methanol on the surface, there is a barrier, about 1.4 EV, for the scission of the bond between oxygen and hydrogen. But it can be done. And there's yet another barrier, which would then give you methyl, OK? Uh, you could do this other one instead of having these two barriers. You, there's also this other barrier, which would give you that. And both would give you methyl, which would be the starting point for formation of, uh, of uh, acetaldehyde. Well, how does it happen? Uh, we need to overcome these barriers. And the next thing is that we, as an experiment, we need to bring in CO. So when we bring in CO, Again, something, two things can happen. One is CO could just go grab the oxygen and form CO2, okay? And then more CO would come in and then that could, would, would, would be, could react. So what would happen then is that if you had this CH3, uh, the metal, and you got now CO adsorbed and CO adsorption is uh, on these things, is, is, uh, it's not a very uh, energetically, um, uh, uh, and it is favorable. Uh, and, and so you would get acetyl. So formation of acetyl is very probable. And of course, both are going on. Some carbon dioxide is being formed and some acetyl is being formed. And then when you get acetyl, you could also 
get uh, get this. This is again a barrier here. This is with the CHO that gets produced in the process. And again, we've shown that 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 when you have carbon monoxide and hydrogen on the surface, you would get CHO, as I showed in the earlier one. Then you basically would get uh, acetaldehyde. So just from energetic considerations, what we are able to show here is that indeed that is that is a possibility. And, and essentially what they're observing in an experiment is, is great, that basically we have gone from methanol to acetaldehyde. So let me see, I think uh, I will skip that. Uh, this is the experimental verification of that. Uh, I, let me see how much, how much time I have, I'm getting, okay, so I have about a few more minutes uh, to do this, but let me go quickly over this and you will see my slides. This is not too different, but it does raise an interesting question. This is now what I showed you before. This is when you had just a row vacancy on molybdenum disulfide. Now, what if you grew molybdenum disulfide on copper, which uh, Ludwig Bartels did, and did see row vacancies there? Well, then quite a few processes can happen. And basically, what we saw here is that uh, you could get formaldehyde, you could get methanol, you could get methane, you could get uh, ethanol. So, and these are not the only products that you could get. So as you all know, uh, just looking at energetic considerations is not gonna be enough. We need to include kinetics in the process, okay? So when we did include it, did kinetic Monte Carlo simulations with the good bunch of uh, processes, which again, let me not uh, go over this. You can look at uh, my slides, which will be available to you, but, and you see some high barriers, but then you see quite feasible processes. When you did all that, we actually, under the conditions that we were looking at, these are the ratios of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. We did see production of um, uh, ethanol, and methane, and under those conditions, we didn't see methanol. We did see formaldehyde, we did see some water. And so these are the products that we would be predicting. So what do they see experimentally? Well, this is again something that Katrina sent me last night, that what they are seeing right now is a part that we did not consider. And this is the formation of ethylene. Uh, they also get propene. So, so the question here is again, that yes, it is reactive, MOS2, just MOS2, when you create vacancies, is experimentally reactive. It's, it behaves like a fissure top uh, catalyst. When you do this on copper, under the condition that, uh, uh, that uh, Blair has in his lab, you do get uh, these other reactions. These, of course, reactions, we now have them and we have included them, and now we're putting them in our kinetic Monte Carlo simulation. So uh, let me just pause here because I'm going to go over uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the next one and see if you have any questions on just what we have done with uh, molybden on molybdenum disulfide with either defects or with nanoparticles or growing them on a metal substrate. So do we have any questions at this point? You can type them into the chat or, or just type an X. Um, I think, I mean, this, we've never done this before. So, so perhaps we can just continue. And then if you have some questions at the end, you that's can fine. also ask. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe we will just do that because I think that's, that's the format we've had and okay. I don't know. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, no, no that's fine. And uh, so, so basically, you know, this, is, this was the holy grail of MOS2. While we were doing it, M MOS2, uh, Richard Blair would, got very excited and said, well, what about hexagonal boron nitride? Well, we said, oh, hexagonal boron nitride. Uh, we thought that it was a, an insulator, not even a semiconductor. You know, there was all this hype about molybdenum disulfide. We were also on the side uh, looking at other properties of, of that material. But then we looked at this. And uh, the one that I won't talk to you about is that 
when we have vacancies in there, then what Blair's group was able to show that you can actually convert a whole bunch of alkenes to alkanes. Okay? And this is already published. I won't be talking about that. What I will talk about more is how do we get, uh, how do we hydrogenate uh, carbon dioxide? And, and it's very interesting that we get at low temperatures, uh, what the result will be that at temp low temperatures, 20 degrees centigrade, 120 degrees centigrade, what we get is methanol. And if we go to somewhat higher temperatures, if we go to 160 degrees centigrade or so, uh, we get formic acid. So, so let's see how that uh, happens. So this again, and this is the, uh, what is important is that, you know, um, boron nitride is important because you can have a boron vacancy, you can have a nitrogen vacancy, you can have places where boron is substituted by nitrogen or vice versa. Uh, you can have a rotation of bonds, which is called stone whales uh, 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 defect. Uh, there can be others. You can also implant other uh, uh, atoms here. But one thing that I wanted, and, and I think some of you are already aware of that, is that this thing here is uh, uh, in, when you talk about in, uh, NV centers is what has been the quest in diamond. And in diamond, when they create an NV center, they they take a carbon out and put it, uh, put a nitrogen in and hope that near nitrogen they have vacancies. And that is the NV center from which they get these uh, emission, single photon emission. And so that has been the source. But as you know that in diamond, it is, it is a bulk material. It is very difficult to control the environment. But if you go to something like hexagonal boron nitride, if this is successful, you know exactly what the environment is. So NV centers can be created without any trouble. So that's why the, uh, there's uh, interest in boron hexagonal boron nitride from the, from the quantum science or quantum information science point of view. But that's not our concern here. So let me not uh, go uh, into that. Let me just show you that what we will be doing is talking mainly about that, but since I am a physicist, I will still bore you with one more detail, which is that when you have these vacancies, particularly these vacancies, these are very important. What you see here is, we, and these are, these are spin uh, polarized calculations, and what you see, see here is that it costs a very small amount of energy to flip the spin of the electron when you have this nitrogen vacancy. So I'm just going to leave it at that. That is really the rationale for what is going on. Uh, the others are also important, but they, but they act differently. This is uh, the boron vacancy, where again, you've got uh, states 20 orbitals right at the Fermi level. Uh, and then and, and this one, the stone whales, I would not say is, is very reactive, but then this boron substitution could also be. But the main ones are, nitrogen vacancy, and of course the baron vacancy. Now what you see here is these are calculated values for the adsorption energy of carbon dioxide and hydrogen dissociated. This is, yeah, I'll go through the process. Uh, on these, very nice, very nicely adsorbed. Uh, this is NMR data from our colleague Jim Harper, and, and basically if you go through the details of that, it actually, these three peaks correspond to three different sites, types of sites that, uh, that uh, CO2, uh, that this carbon in CO2 could be adsorbed in. So this is actually pretty, pretty uh, impressive uh, confirmation. Uh, the other thing is that uh, they, there are other, uh, you know, we looked at propene, ethene, and so on for the other calculation, and they also were able to adsorb on, on this. Now, how does all this happen? I've shown you this already. The main thing to mention is that if you're looking at the charge density, this is really the electron cloud that near the vacancy, that it is not right there, but it, it is also at nearby places. So what do we hear? Do here, what I'm going to do is essentially show you this. You're coming down with the CO2. Uh, this is the pi star anti-bonding orbitals that we're showing here. 
it comes down and basically what you see in this movie and you can keep your eye on both the things here and as I flip this what you see on the right hand side here is how the charge density or the electronic uh, arrangement is, is, is modifying itself and how the CO2 is going to be bending and you see that bending right there which is very important for it to, to absorb and there it goes and then it goes and finally it gets absorbed and there is CO2 absorbed on the surface. So CO2 adsor is absorbed, it is absorbed there, but it has also left this excess charge over here, okay? So now what we do is that we bring in then, uh, the, this is quite a facile uh, adsorption, and now we bring in the hydrogen. So the hydrogen comes in, the CO2 is already there, and now, now the hydrogen is gonna come in, and basically what you're gonna see as, as the hydrogen comes closer to the surface, you look at the picture on the right, that all those charge hybrid, I mean, orbitals are hybridizing, rearrangements are happening. Here is the transition state, and here, boom, it is now on the surface. Okay, so basically, uh, the 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 excess charge that we had at boron, this is all created because of that vacancy there. This facilitated the, the dissociation of hydrogen. So, so there is a, an interesting uh, point here that if we were to first absorb hydrogen and then CO2, hydrogen would have seen a, a barrier. So one uh, takeaway is that uh, we should have a good number, of, a good bit of hydrogen present in the system. But once that happens, then the, then the rest of it proceeds and pretty soon what you have, you've got CO2 absorbed on the surface and then you've got the two, two hydrogens there. Okay, so, so then uh, what, what else will go on? Well, this is then you've got the CO2 and hydrogen, and maybe I will not bore you with all the details here, but essentially uh, the formation then of, uh, of uh, I should know these, but, but this is where you can see that my degree is not in chemistry. Uh, the product formation takes place with H HCOO and absorbed and, and a hydrogen atom absorbed. And eventually then you get to formic acid. Okay, so you got to that. All right, what else can go on? Well, what you could get, if you could have gotten to this state here, so this is, this is basically the same thing, but it's just giving you all the DFT results for what we have. So this is again, because of that excess charge, if I were to go through the uh, that uh, you know little cartoon again, it is really the excess charge that is again making the H2 dissociation facile. So so these things are happening on different sites, and at all these different sites close to the vacancy, you're getting these various things to happen. Now uh, uh, the, the the these are again some more of these that what happens then when you have more hydrogen in the system, how do you form, go to that process? I think, I think we should skip these basically and give you some of the results here. So essentially uh, what you find is uh, when you go through this process, you end up with, with this, the carbon dioxide absorb, right? And now let's see what will happen. Well. Now, if we had gotten the other way, so this is just summarizing the two processes, okay? The first one there was we started with hydrogen and then we got that. The second one was we started with, with carbon dioxide or we had coadsorption going on and that is a more facile process. But what both of those lead to, what I've shown you so far, is that they lead to formic acid. But what else can go on? Well, what else can go on is that you could have this, another path from here. And again, if you go through these various processes, one path would be formic acid formation, uh, but then you could also have this other path, which is also very feasible, and that will give you methanol in the end. Okay, so you could get formic acid or you could get methanol. In fact, if you look at this, something that we did not think well, would be happening would be the uh, the, the, uh, the, the, that the formation of methanol would be happening at lower temperatures and formic acid at higher temperatures. And the difference between here is that we're really looking at, uh, this is in the gas form, okay, this is physics. 
okay, gas in the sense that it is, it's in the system, but not uh, connected to the, uh, sitting on the, on the catalyst ready to be uh, moved away. So, 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 so this is where uh, the summary then of all of this is that formic acid formation is, uh, happens at higher temperatures and methanol formation at lower temperatures. I think I'm going to skip these. You can look at these slides later, but let me go on to just the summary and the experimental results then that uh, <coughs> would be, would be, I think I'm coming close to my end, so I should uh, just do this. So, so this is the experimental part where uh, you have this mechanical reactor and ball milling goes on. And essentially then what they're seeing is that, uh, and these are the different cycles, okay? So, the, uh, so, so they're seeing how much CO2 is being absorbed. I'll show you some more confirmation of what we have, what we're talking about. But basically what we find is, uh, is that even though the yield decreases, but even after you're talking about, you know, 20 hours and then the second one is the second cycle and so on and so forth, that even after all these hours and these many cycles, we are getting the conversion rate plateaus at above 70%. And there's a high, very high selectivity, 70%. So the yield is 70 to 80% of, uh, of, uh, of methanol at 20 degrees centigrade, okay? Uh, these are the mass spec and the chromatogram pictures here. Uh, this is the same result shown at 120 degrees. And what I didn't have here is the result that happens at 160 where you see, start seeing formic acid. So methanol is, the, uh, is, is formed. And now just to uh, give you a, some more of the experimental validation is that this is the infrared spectrum, uh, which is, you know, this is just to show what really is in the system. And you see that uh, when, as, as the CO2 gets uh, uh, exposed, uh, vacancies are created, CO2 exposure starts, and you see this uh, frequency shift, which we assign to that of the, uh, of, the, of, of, of the shift in the CO2 uh, spectrum. And then this is temperature program resorption of CO2. And, and again, what you find is that uh, water is coming out later. You see uh, th this is uh, CO2 over here. Uh, with the peaks correspond to CO2 coming from different uh, uh, sites, and then you've got CO. And finally, what we have here is, uh, um, is, is again, evidence for, uh, for, the, for carbonyls being present in the system. So these are just various things coming from experimental uh, data. This, has, this paper has been submitted, and anybody interested, I can send you to them. So that should bring me to my conclusions because I think I'm allowed 45 minutes and I'm getting close to that. Um, so basically what I tried to show you in this part was that hexagonal boron nitride is, um, is actually a very viable catalyst provided you create defects. When you create defects, you create mid-gap states, which is well known as we did in molybdenum disulfide. These, well, these, these uh, states right close to the Fermi level are very important. Uh, they're important for reasons even other than catalysis. And when we are thinking about catalysis, what we are thinking about is, is actually the charge redistribution around the uh, vacancy. And that charge redistribution uh, really leads to formation of bond with CO2 as it approaches the surface. And CO2 then adsorbs close to the vacancy, leaving enough charge near the vacancy for H2 to come and coadsorb dissociatively. Uh, once that happens, then the process goes on and, and there's diffusion, there's further adsorption, there's creation of intermediates. And to a little bit of our surprise, what we found that both experimentally and now, and also theoretically, that the formation of formic acid, even though that was the first thing that we looked at, to get it from chemisorb to physisorb state, it, uh, it, it requires more energy 
than it does for methanol. And so in the experiment, what they see is they see methanol at uh, low temperatures, low temperatures being less than 120 degrees or less. And what I didn't show you the, uh, the slide for, because I didn't have it on hand, is that formic acid uh, was found after 160 degrees C. It is in the paper that has been submitted. So basically, all of these uh, discoveries uh, pave the way for development of some sustainable methods to capture and reduce our carbon dioxide. And certainly, hexagonal boron nitride is a material that we would like to promote. And thank you very much for your attention. OK, thank you so much, Talat, um, for that really interesting talk. Um, so now we Let's stop have, here. Uh, I mean, I think you can keep it. Um, we can still see you in the small screen. Okay. Just, I mean, it, it's up to you, but in case yeah, you no, to turn to a slide. So feel free to ask a question in the chat. And okay, while we do that, then I think maybe I can ask maybe a really general question because uh -huh. I actually, I mean, I'm not really familiar with um, thermal catalytic processes in general. But are these materials showing mechanisms that are really, really different to say transition metals or like um, kind of three-dimensional materials? Can we understand this in terms of kind of like using a sort of descriptor-based approach that's been established for three dimensions, for instance? I, I, th I think so. I think, I, think, I think that, okay, so yes and no. So when we're looking at MOS2, uh, I think our conclusion at this point is that it is be behaving like a Fischer-Tropsch catalyst, and and the only reason for going into it would be uh, w w would be that uh, we, uh, you know it, it is something that is more readily available and uh, and cheaper and so on. Okay, but then there's some uh, transition metal uh, catalysts that are also cheap. So. So, but I think for hexagonal boron nitride, uh, it's it's metal free. Mm -hmm. So, so while our thought process, and I, I totally agree with you that what we need to do is put all of these in terms of descriptors, like uh, you know Jens's group has been doing, and and that would be the approach we'll be taking. What we are talking about here is really you know there are no d orbitals here. You know we're talking about boron nitride. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think the boron nitride is quite interesting because it basically, uh, it is more in terms of thinking in terms of frontier orbitals and about how hybridization takes place and how, uh, you know, first of all, the coadsorption uh, was very important. Yeah. You know, this is, this is not, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's stunning yeah. because things do coadsorb. Uh, but uh, but what is interesting is that uh, is that that is really what facilitated it. Yeah. So yeah. basically, it's not like we can take a volcano we have and place yeah. it on there because it basically follows its own. It own follows its own. And, 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 right. Exactly. Exactly. And 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 that. Uh, so so the, we we had more room to play with in a certain sense. Uh, with uh, uh, hexagonal boron nitride, uh, one because we couldn't think in terms of D bands, mm -hmm. and and we had to think in terms of really uh, polarization effects brought about when you bring in when you have a vacancy, and then when you bring in uh, these molecules and how the orbitals then reshape themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 yeah, so so I think. Uh, the steric effects, for example, so for, you know, in, in the case of uh, CO2, if you did not have that bending, it's not going to absorb. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, you add another dimension to what we have been thinking about. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so thanks, thanks for the answer. And I think we have a question. Nitish, would you like to read or? Yeah, so. Ah, okay. Yeah, the question is from Mega Anand, and the question is, do we experimentally know how the edges of hexagonal boron nitride are terminated? Ah, okay. So that is a very good question. No, we don't. Mm. Uh, we don't. And, and, uh, 
and and that would certainly be so so that would certainly be even in terms of uh, uh, theory see well, one of the problems that we have here is that these uh, samples are rather large uh, and and so it's really a sheet there and uh, what role edges are playing is a good question but that has not been quantified one problem that we are having right now is that we have asked a couple of our colleagues to do these experiments in UHV, and that is still underway. And when that happens, we would be able to better characterize the edges. So, so my answer to you would be that right now we don't know. And, and that would make a difference uh, if we were to do a control study in, in yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question, uh, which is um, that you, you, so you said that there's like uh, various um, defects that you can have in, in hexagonal boron nitrate. So I was wondering, uh, so have you computed the reaction profiles for all of these different defects, that possible defects that you showed, or did you only consider yeah, the one so, that? No, so we did, we looked at, uh, we did, there were four that I showed you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, so, so we did look for, uh, for the paper that uh, is uh, to come out has to do with uh, uh, the small molecules on, on this, uh, on, on the surface. And, uh, and there we show how the adsorption uh, of the different small molecules takes place on the different defects. Now, the full calculation, full blown calculation on the other, we haven't done, done all of that. So if you are interested in adsorption energies and dissociation energies hmm. and, and so on, then those we have. Okay. But, uh, but, but we, we, we would, the, the one to accompany, so, you know, one of the things that, that always is good is to accompany all these with the kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, which I didn't show you for hmm. hexagonal boron nitride. And that there we should be having the other, uh, at least the boron vacancy. So okay. those would be the two that I think would uh, would probably uh, contribute the most. Maybe someone else wants to answer. Okay. Because I asked because then if you know uh, the kind of defect that is, is most active, I was wondering also experimentally then would there be a way to engineer more of those defects so you can get... Right. So our main problem right now, and again, Nitish, as I was telling you, I, if, uh, if we can get people excited, uh, we, we can also get them excited because of all this uh, role that these defects play in quantum uh, information, right? Mm -hmm. and, and nowadays, that's a big buzzword, quantum science. Uh, so so I, think, uh, I, I think that would be very interesting. My, uh, what we have concluded, particularly when we saw the data from uh, uh, the, the, the samples that were given for NMR studies is that the other defect was also contributing. So this was both boron vacancy and nitrogen vacancy were contributing. Okay, great. Uh, yes, so there's a follow-up question from Mega, which is that uh, she says she's not an experimentalist, but are the hexagonal boron nitrate experiments done on like one sheet or, or do you also have something else beneath? Okay, so uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if, uh, Bla if Richard Blair or Katrina are, uh, uh, I, I, it is, so, so it is done on something. It is done on silica, I think. Okay. Uh, somebody else can, can answer can, that. I can answer that. Uh, yeah, uh, you can answer that. Go ahead, Dewey. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, the experiment done with uh, a lot of uh, um, boron nitride where they have a both boron nitride and then they, they some kind of uh, following techniques, so then you might come up, you might have a single layer or, or double layer, triple layer, but you have a lot of them. It's not like single layer, per se. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so the next question is by Robert Stevens Boyd. And the question is, if the disruption of the double bond symmetry of CO2 is key to its reduction, uh, do you believe that the addition of more nucleo slash electrophilic dopants around the defect sites would enhance activity? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I mean, that would, be, that would be very interesting. What would be some example that you would have in mind? That'd be something. Robert, if you have something, you can post that in the chat or... Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really interesting because, uh, yeah, we would like to. Uh, yes, I'm um, sorry, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes. Um, I would say certain um, materials, say certain like you what you would do with semiconductor type materials to make it um, more nuclear or electrophilic, give it um, additions of holes or electron sites. You want certain metal oxides um, that have more basic or acidic quality mm -hmm. might be helpful. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. this is just um, a thought that um, popped into my head. Okay. Well, it would be, it would be uh, good to follow up on that. We would love to see some more work in the area. These are, so, you know, these are results that have, they've taken a while to get to this point, And I think what we're looking for the most is uh, more uh, results under more control uh, conditions. Uh, and, and uh, you know, when people try to do things in UHV, it doesn't always pan out. So, uh, so you know, these, these are all happening at temperatures of 120 C and so on. So, so yeah, so we, we, we would love to get any feedback. And if, if the experimentalists who could do it, we'd love that even more. I'm actually an experimentalist myself, so... Okay, where are you, Robert? Uh, where am I? I'm at the Technical University in Denmark. Oh, great. Yeah, that would be great to talk to you. Yeah, we're, uh, if, sure. you don't mind, uh, if you don't mind sending an email, we could follow up on this. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be um, very definitely nice. the partnership would be much appreciated if we could do that. That'd be great. That'd be wonderful. And anything on HBN, and you know, we could also arrange for samples to be sent and so on. Uh, anything on HBN would be fantastic. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I have a I have a question about your um, supported nanoclusters. Is you uh -huh. shown that it's capable of doing these the CC coupling? And I was wondering, does the is is it promoted by the presence of the MOS two on gold? I mean, for instance, if you just took gold now clusters on on a different support, or yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Where does that so, come from? so 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 when you take so gold has been worked on by a, a, a number of uh, uh, elements, right? I mean, a, a number of supports, uh, the titania in particular, and so on. The, the thing that we find different for gold on MOS2 is that a gold, there is charge transfer, uh, but all the reaction happens on the gold nanoparticle, okay? Mm -hmm. So in other words, what it turns out is that MOS2 can be a great support for gold nanoparticles to perform and the way they perform is different from when they are on titania okay so for example if you're interested in in methanol decomposition you would use titania as a support if you're interested in methanol formation then you would use mos2 so the reaction pathway is very different okay and and, and yeah, so that, that's where the role of the support was really striking in this case. And for gold, you know, there has been a quest for, you know, gold nanoparticles are really great, but do, is, is the gold nanoparticle doing the job or is it being brought about because of the interface, mm -hmm. right? So obviously interface here also plays a role, but the reaction is what we find, and we've done quite a few calculations of this, is that the reactions are all happening on the gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I was, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, so you're saying also, at, so what about the interface, like so the boundary between the gold nanoparticle and the MOS2, so you're saying that it still happens on gold, but not at the... Yeah, so, so, the, so the, what the boundary, so basically that, that I mean, there is, uh, there is charge transfer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and then you can also ask, you know, of course, if you have a vacancy on MOS2, uh, then, then, then there's even, then there's a strong covalent bonding, okay? Mm -hmm. But even if you don't have a vacancy, gold still, gold nanoparticles still, uh, you know, bind with that surface. 
and there's charge transfer that goes on. Uh, however, uh, it's not reactive, or the particles or the sites near it mm. are not reactive. Well, one reason is that you've got sulfur. Mm. I mean, you know, sulfur and gold do do have a have a have a connection with each other, right? You, they want to form uh, a, a bond. So, so, and but but we saw the same thing with silver and copper. So, in all of these cases, uh, there is there is a you know it, it it is a stable system, but it acts more as a support than as really changing the properties of the nanoparticle. Mm -hmm. In other words, letting the nanoparticle be reactive, ha promoting active sites on the nanoparticles. And the active sites on the nanoparticle are the ones that are at the at the tips, that are at the, you know, at the, the undercoordinated sites that are at the top or the sides. Mm -hmm. And the one that the one paper, I, I don't know when uh, the, the one that uh, well, I don't know if I can go back to this. Let's see if I can uh, it takes a while to go get back to it. So uh, one of the ones that I showed which had to do with um, hmm, that's funny i'm not able to get back to that but i i don't know if you remember i showed the one with the co oxidation uh so let me do the stop share and uh then i if i get back to this that may help me yeah now the, so the i had this um, uh, gold on uh, co oxidation which was experimentally uh, verified and that will be, we did that to see if they could look at it. That was an easy thing to do. I think I'm coming to it in a second. And there, what we found is that it was really the edges. And here again, the edge, uh, edges of the, so that was a 2D, that was almost like a 2D gold layer. Right. So if I can share my screen again. Back on. This is, I thought I was quite used to. Now I don't know where I have gone. You can't see my screen, right? Because I'm not sharing it. No. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, oh, that is, well, okay. So, I think, uh, I think I'll probably have to. Somehow, escape. Well, okay. I, at least I got to this point. Or, right. sorry about that. This is. Uh, we are still in the learning process, so let me just do that. Yeah. So this may be not so good. Okay. So here now I can see chat as well. So now if you see my screen, uh, okay. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Okay. So so the interesting thing here, and this is again what we really, what bore out with experiments as well, is that experimentally, they, they vouch for the fact that it is really a 2D, a two layer system. Uh, but whether it is a two layer or three layer, the point is that the reactions were all happening at the edges. You see, so, so you may ask over here, well, this is close to the interface. But when we were looking at, um, at uh, uh, gold on on titania basically the reaction would happen right here between the between the gold and the oxygen and the titanium so mm -hmm. so those would be the reasons whereas over here everything is on gold even if it is close to the interface okay mm -hmm. so I, I don't know if gold on titania has been looked at but do computations also show um the, the selectivity change that yeah, the gold on titania. A gold on titania was uh, has looked at experimentally, okay, quite a bit. And so uh, initially, it was the CO oxidation that they were looking at, and then methanol decomposition, which was done by Donna Chen, and CO oxidation by a good number of people, John Yates, and a good number of people in the old days. So that that was the one of the classic papers Wayne Goodman was doing, looking at it, as to. So the you know the question with gold nanoparticles have, has always been that is it is it the nanoparticle re alone, or is it the support yeah. uh, that 
the you know in Haruta's when you look at Haruta's old papers, the you know the ones that got this whole field started, uh, he always had gold nanoparticles on a support, whether it was silica or that was titania or any of those. That was always an oxide support in his case. So the question has always been, uh, you know, uh, uh, what about gold nanoparticles by themselves? Well, they have to be put on something, otherwise they're going to sinter, mm -hmm. right? So, so part of what we are saying over here is that MOS2 is the support which actually doesn't allow them to sinter. We, we see when as we have STM images of these, and and they don't they don't center, and 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 the and the performance is on the nanoparticle. Of course, there is charge transfer, so it is not like it is just a support that is not doing anything. Mm -hmm. But from what I understand, experimentalists who've been putting gold on silica or other substrates have not been able to get this, this clear cut result. So that that is what I would put as okay. as what is interesting here. And could we attribute a lot of the effect to charge transfer, or does the kind of chemical nature of these interface sites, does that matter? Or like when we say, oh yeah, there's some charge transfer, then could we in principle understand everything in terms of the, the charge that's then placed on the gold nanoparticle? So, so what I would say is that, is that I think in terms, well, charge, they, they are probably all related, mm -hmm. Unless and until you bring orbitals close to the Fermi level, mm -hmm. you're not going to see anything. Mm -hmm. so, so in all of these cases, whether the reaction is taking place on gold or whether it is taking place on MOS2 with the vacancy or whatever, we have had, um, because of the perturbation, we've had states driven very close to the Fermi level, mm -hmm. whether it is occupied or unoccupied. Mm -hmm. And usually it's both. Mm -hmm. So, so we would say that the availability of the un, uh, unoccupied and the presence of the occupied very close to the Fermi level is 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 is, is necessary. And part of the reason for that is that you know you always have uh, catalysis by itself means you're not in the ground state anymore. You know, some things, you know, even if it is thermal, uh, you know, say some energy is being put into the system. Now the question is, how much energy do you need? Mm -hmm. so, so I would think in terms of manipulation of the orbitals, hybridizations of the orbitals, and again, of activity very close to the Fermi level. Yeah. So I, I think that that got more solidified this way of thinking when we are talking in terms of boron nitride. Mm -hmm. Because boron nitride takes you back to almost a system where you have no metal and, and yet you can have these reactions. Yeah. Interesting. So about boron nitride, is it ever, I mean, have you looked at it as also a support material? Okay. So yeah. that, is how, that is how it is always done, right? I mean, experimentally. Experimentally, uh, boron nitride is the most benign, most benign substrate. Mm -hmm. So it has a, it is close to 6 EV, 5.85 EV or something band gap. Mm -hmm. So it is something that, that is always used as a support. Uh, we are right now in a very different context looking at uh, single molecule magnets on boron nitride. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there, when you take just boron nitride, without any vacancy in it, 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 it basically is an excellent support. So you can have a lot of reactions going on. Now, what is interesting is that even there, and this is something we're trying to understand, uh, because of the presence of nitrogen, and, and, and uh, which I think reacts quite strongly, and boron also probably, to anything that is on it, this is all Van der Waals interaction, and yet you get redistribution of charges within boron nitride. So some polarization does happen. Mm -hmm. And again, our focus has been on single layer boron nitride. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, you, could, you could certainly, so for example, we could do the same calculations with the uh, gold nanoparticles on, on, on boron nitride, right? But our goal here was that uh, Richard Blair can introduce these defects 
in boron nitride without any any yeah. difficulty. And and it is a material that you can get, you can buy sheets of it and you can do this. So that is quite a yeah. cheap catalyst. And and these reactions show that it can capture CO2. So so part of it is going after CO2. But but we could extend this to other studies. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense that so much has been done on transition metal metals and you have got this uh, descriptor uh, approach of what kind of a descriptor approach would you apply here yeah, yeah. and and and, and that, that that's a very good question and yeah. we need to do uh, some more studies and yeah. particularly do it as nitish was saying on different kinds of vacancies yeah. so we can get to get to that yeah yeah what would be really nice <laughs> is if we could have just descriptors then for all these 2D materials, I guess. That would be fantastic. Yeah. 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 Sure. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But even as is, like, I, I do get the sense that maybe there's some insights here that we can transfer over also to some of the electrocatalytic reactions we look at. Because for instance, CO2 is really important. And, you know, right. Maybe, yeah. Right. I don't know. I know. I, yeah, I, I'm aware of your work and the what you're doing there so so we should talk we should talk some yeah. more about uh, you know whether some of this could be done yeah. in electrocatalysis where, where conditions are much more controlled right and you don't need the UHV environment where very little happens yeah yeah I guess on the one hand it's it's in some ways it's more controlled in in other cases it's it's also have, more yeah you have yeah. the solvent which can do a lot yeah yeah <laughs> basically yeah, that's what I was thinking yeah. yeah. So, so, who's working on the experiments with you? Um, a number of, of, of different groups. I mean, we have we have surf cats here and uh -huh. uh, right. Stanford and at different places. Yeah, it's so. But like, like, what in particular were you thinking about? Well, what I was thinking about was that well, what what materials would they be interested in? I think they would generally be interested in a new catalyst. We just have to come up with one. <laughs> so, and I think if we can make the case, it, some, somebody will, will make it. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, okay. But we have a lot of trouble with that. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. And the ones they're looking at right now would be what? Transition metals? Yeah. 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 But yeah. maybe going beyond that is, is needed. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, I mean, that's been the whole goal here, that can we go beyond transition metals and see what kinds of descriptors. But you're very right. We should be focusing on what are the descriptors here, mm -hmm. yeah. which gives you a kind of a, you know, a, yeah. a quick, quick, yeah. quick guideline to experimentalists about yeah. how to proceed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what's really interesting is that it shows such a different mechanism when you yeah. go from 3D yeah. to 3D. So, yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so I think that we don't have other questions and I think our time, I mean, at least our scheduled time is up. Okay. So, um, so thanks so much for that talk. And I, I think I'll look into it a little bit further just to see as if there's something we can offer.